of man's superiority over nature, the largest and most luxurious ship in the world. But RMS Titanic's place in history was sealed not by its splendor, but by the loss of over a thousand lives as this unsinkable ship sank in the freezing dark waters of the Atlantic only four days after it first set sail. Now new groundbreaking evidence and testimony has been uncovered to reveal the true story of one of those lives. A man whose identity went down with the ship, but whose name has become a Hollywood legend, Jack Dawson. For the first time, the true story of Jack Dawson is revealed, where he lived, his romantic affairs, his descendants, and his tragic death on board the Titanic. It's the powerful story of one of history's unknowns, whose life, like many Titanic victims, was a mystery, undiscovered until now. It was film director James Cameron who made the name Jack Dawson famous. His Oscar-winning film, Titanic, made the human tragedy of this disaster come to life through a powerful love story. Jack Dawson, a third-class passenger and traveling artist, fell in love with Rose DeWitt Butaker, a first-class passenger. As Titanic hits an iceberg and sinks, Dawson valiantly tries to save Rose, but like so many that night, tragically dies in the dark, freezing water. In Fairview Cemetery, Halifax, Nova Scotia, in Canada, lie the bodies of 121 men, women, and children. The human consequences of this tragedy. Here, myths and reality blur. Could this really be Jack Dawson's final resting place? Now, I'll tell you folks, a lot of people get mixed up and they think this is Leonardo DiCaprio, the character that played Jack Dawson. <laughs> and when the movie first came out, there'd be hundreds of girls here a week. And they'd leave flowers, but they'd leave things like hotel keys, <laughs> pictures of themselves, poetry, and they would sob on this stone saying, I love you, Leonardo, what happened? I saw you it's now TV over three years since the film Titanic was released, but of course, it's and the graves have become a well-established tourist attraction with cruise ships making special stops to visit the cemetery. Even today, Dawson's grave continues to be covered with flowers. Yet the irony is that director James Cameron had no idea that there was a man called Jay Dawson on the ship until after he had written the screenplay. Both the characters of Jack Dawson and Rose DeWitt Butaker, he maintains, are completely fictitious. So who is the Dawson buried in this grave with the number of 227 on his tombstone? What did he look like? How did he die? Did he leave behind a sweetheart? Could his descendants still be alive today? Until now, all that was known about him was written here on this stone. The search for his true identity begins in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Halifax played a key part in the unfolding drama after Titanic sank over 80 years ago. As soon as news of the sinking of Titanic reached land, it sent shockwaves around the world. Distraught relatives quickly gathered at the offices of the ship's owners, the White Star Line in England and America, desperate for news. Some even traveled to Halifax, Titanic's nearest landfall. When the news finally came that the world's largest ship had, had sunk and that more than 1,500 people had died, the world, and in particular Britain and America, were plunged into a great sense of despair. 
um, it was in many respects the, the same sort of despair that we all felt when the, the Challenger disaster happened or the Estonia disaster perhaps. As the scale of the tragedy began to unfold, a telegraph cable-laying ship from Halifax, the Mackie Bennett, was the first to be quickly dispatched to the site where Titanic went down, 700 nautical miles away. On board was a local firm of undertakers, their grim task to find as many bodies as they could. They arrived late at night, and in fact, they saw a body as it was getting dark. And when dawn broke the next morning, they were surrounded by debris. And in the words of uh, Frederick Lardner, the captain of the Mackie Bennett, it looked like a, a flock of seagulls on the water until they got up close to it. And they realized that these seagulls were, in fact, life-jacketed bodies floating bolt upright in the very, very cold sea. For the first time, the wireless messages sent by the Mackie Bennett can be revealed. These amazing messages were saved from destruction as the White Star Line offices in New York were about to throw them away. Only now has their importance been realized. These incredible messages reveal how the crew of the Mackie Bennett and those of other ships that followed were overwhelmed by the task before them when they reached the scene of the disaster. Drifting in dense fog, bodies are numerous. Extending many miles east and west, male ships should give this a wide berth. Medical opinion is that death has been practically instantaneous in all cases, owing to pressure when bodies drawn down in vortex. Total picked up, 205. Crews attended burial after burial as more than half the bodies they found were committed to the sea because they feared the impact of bringing mutilated bodies home. But the White Star Line telegraphed the Mackie Bennett insisting that as many bodies as possible were brought back to Halifax. The body of Jay Dawson was one of those brought back to land. The idea was that as many victims as possible would be brought back for interment. In the event, however, a relatively small number actually were. The uh, currents and the elements and sea life um, saw to it that of the 1,523 who were lost, there were only 330 bodies recovered. As the bodies were pulled out of the cold, unforgiving water, careful notes were made for identification in a ledger book. Each person was given a number. The number from the top of each entry page. Rarely seen photographs taken by the priest on board the Minia the second ship to search for bodies, gives a unique insight into the task that lay before them. As a body was recovered, it was treated according to the social class of the day. A first-class passenger was embalmed and placed in a wooden coffin in the forward part of the ship. Second class was wrapped in canvas and kept in the center of the ship and the bodies of third class or crew were put in an ice-filled room until they got on shore and embalming could take place. On Tuesday, April 30th, two weeks after she set sail, the Mackie Bennett returned to Halifax with its cargo of death. Her decks piled high with coffins and bodies. The church bells tolled, 
The stores draped their windows in black, and flags flew at half-mast. The disaster touched many people uh, because they, it involved well-known names, but it also involved the poorest of immigrants. I think that fact that death had touched all equally was a factor in the degree of mourning that Titanic engendered. Hearses took the bodies to a temporary morgue, the Mayflower curling rink. There they were embalmed and laid out, ready for identification by relatives. There, body number 227, the same number as on the grave in Fairview Cemetery, lay, waiting to be claimed. But no one came forward. The Titanic had struck an iceberg shortly before midnight on the 14th of April, 1912. As the ship started to sink, many passengers had been in bed and didn't think to bring identification with them as they headed for the lifeboats. So how were the bodies identified when they returned to Halifax? These remarkable photographs are some of the only pictures that still exist of the bodies. They were taken to help relatives identify their loved ones. Could a photograph of body 227 still exist? Would he look anything like the Jack Dawson in the film Titanic? Sadly, there is no picture of his body, but it's possible to get an idea of what he looked like from the notes made on the Mackie Bennett. In them, they describe body 227 as a young man, aged 30, with light hair, a mustache, and wearing a dungaree coat, pants, and a gray shirt. He had no marks on his body. Today, Halifax, Nova Scotia is very different from the shipping port it once was. Yet there still exists a priceless collection of documents and coroner's records revealing details of the Titanic bodies. These documents provide the first pieces of evidence on a trail that begins with Dawson's body being pulled from the water and leads to the city of his birth, thousands of miles away. They're held in the public archives of Nova Scotia. Historians Charles Haas and John Eaton were the first Americans to carefully study the records of those buried in Halifax. So what became of the rest of them? In the film Titanic, Jack Dawson is portrayed as a third-class American passenger. But what of body 227? These documents suggest that Dawson may not have been a first, second, or third-class passenger. Definitely a backwards form. It did not appear to them at first glance that this was a passenger because of the manner of dress, and so therefore they presumed that it may have been a member of the crew. Rare pictures showing some of the few crew members who survived the sinking of the Titanic reveal their clothes are very similar to those described in the coroner's records for body 227. As most of the crew worked below the waterline, he would have had a long way to run to escape the flooding ship and reach the lifeboat decks. Now, from the fact that he was fairly well-dressed with a, an actual jacket on, uh, you could probably surmise that, that this individual was not on watch at the time the disaster happened. The fact that there were no marks on the body meant that the victim had very likely jumped clear of the ship and had not been battered by any of the debris that was uh, liberated when the uh, ship sank. So it might even mean that he was able to swim a few yards away from the uh, sinking vessel before he succumbed to the cold water. J. Dawson, buried in Fairview Cemetery, wasn't James Cameron's Jack Dawson, a romantic third-class passenger traveling to America to make his fortune. He was a member of the crew, earning a living back and forth across the Atlantic. But why 
why was his body never claimed? If he had had a love affair on the ship, as Jack Dawson had done in the film, his lover, like other Titanic survivors, could have come to see his body. His family could also have made arrangements for it to be shipped home. However, the fact that body 227 was left to be buried in Fairview Cemetery might actually throw some light on the sort of family he came from. There is some evidence to suggest that many of the bodies, including number 227, may not have been claimed for reasons of profound personal grief. Um, when you have lost your son, or your husband, or the family breadwinner, um, it is such a catastrophe, especially in these days before insurance policies and, and pensions and, and rescue sch schemes and so forth. Uh, it, it is so overwhelming that the odds are very good that, that you simply would be paralyzed as a family for any number of months afterwards. In some cases, families requested that their loved ones be buried in Halifax rather than brought home because they thought that they had been through enough and they should be left in peace in the new world where their voyage was now complete. Alan Ruffman has been researching into the identities of those buried in many of the unmarked Titanic graves. He believes there might be a more sinister explanation as to why body 227 was never claimed. I think most of those third class and crew members were buried before the, uh, the relatives were ever told that there might be someone in Halifax to be identified. I think there was no attempt made whatsoever to bring the families of crew members over to do identifications. However, many sailors had the belief that if they lived and worked at sea, they might also die at sea. In such a tragedy, their families had little expectation that the bodies of their loved ones would be returned to them. The sea was their home and their grave. Knowing that some bodies might be difficult to identify, they were searched and all personal effects recorded and put in a canvas sack attached to the body. It is these records that provide the first major breakthrough in identifying body 227. In the movie, he was a traveling artist called Jack. Here, the only personal effect recorded on the body was a union card for the National Sailors and Firemen's Union. This card provided them with their only means of identification and proved beyond doubt that body 227 had been a member of the crew. It also provided them with a name, the name of Jay Dawson. From this crucial information, it's possible to piece together Dawson's life, to find out more about where he lived and what sort of life he led. It can also reveal whether he, like others who died on the Titanic, was married. All ships recorded the details of every crew member as they signed on for each voyage. The crew would have to give their age, address, nationality, and the name of the last ship they worked on. If Dawson was a crew member on the Titanic, he must have signed on before the ship left Southampton. This would provide us with some valuable information. But do the papers still exist? And if so, where are they? In the public record office in England are held the country's priceless collection of documents from Shakespeare's will to the trial of King Charles I. Here, among these papers of national importance, are the very signing on books of the Titanic. Over 800 men and women signed on the Titanic as crew in Southampton, England, the port where she started her fateful voyage. A search through these names throws up an important discovery. 
Here is Jay Dawson's very own signature. It's very distinctive, and some of the letters are somewhat ornate, suggesting Dawson had some degree of education. He gives his age as 23, an age very similar to that of Jack Dawson in Cameron's film Titanic, and much younger than originally thought when his body was recovered. His job is described as a trimmer. While the millionaires enjoyed the splendor and luxury of magnificent liners such as Titanic, down below the waterline, in the very bowels of the ship, an army of men worked in a brutal environment. Trimmers had a backbreaking job, shoveling coal from the bunkers to the stokers who put the coal in the furnaces. They carefully took equal amounts from each side so that it wouldn't affect the balance or trim of the ship. The faster the ship went, the faster they worked. The longer the voyage, the more difficult the job became as they went further and further into the bunkers to fetch the coal. If a trimmer collapsed, they were taken on deck, had seawater thrown over them, and sent back down again. Their pay was a meager $7 a month, compared with over $1,100 for a first-class suite on the Titanic. You worked for four hours at a time, and you were expected to uh, do your maximum work at all times. If you didn't, you were fired. Only the officers and chief engineers had a salary from the shipping company. The crew were taken on as casual laborers, signing for each voyage. Each crew member was given a discharge book, which was like a portable employment record to be shown to each new employer. At the end of each voyage, they were assessed according to how well they had worked. If the book was stamped with very good, employment on other ships was easy. If the stamp was withheld, that crew member became almost unemployable. On shore, the trimmers were hard-drinking, hard-fighting men, often recruited from the local bars. Many had no fixed address and stayed as lodgers in the cheapest rented rooms, sleeping on a mattress on the floor and sometimes sharing five men to a room, waiting for the next ship to leave port. So Dawson's life was a hard one, living from hand to mouth, taking exhausting work whenever he could on the great steamships. Southampton was a magnet for trimmers like Dawson, looking for work. The city had been an important European trading port since the time of the Roman Empire. Its medieval walls would have been a familiar sight to him and other crew and passengers of the great steamships. In 1912, the Titanic set sail from here, berth 44. These docks would have been thriving with activity. The passenger trade across the Atlantic was big business. Shipping companies like the White Star Line and the Cunard Line were in fierce competition for wealthy clients and emigrants. When Titanic set sail, she was a registered emigrant ship and her third-class passengers outnumbered first-class by two to one. The Titanic's sister ship, the Olympic, was launched two years earlier, in the October of 1910. Both ships were part of a master plan by the White Star Line. The company knew they couldn't compete with the Cunard Line on speed, so they went for luxury. In 1907, the White Star Line decided to build the three largest and most luxurious ships in the world, the Olympic, the Titanic, and one to be called the Gigantic. The Olympic and Titanic alone would cost four and a half million dollars. 
Although they wouldn't be as fast, they would easily eclipse Cunard's great ships, the Lusitania and the Mauritania, in their splendor. They would cater for American millionaires, middle-class professionals, and what they called a better class of emigrant. White Star believed that immigrants' word of mouth would populate their ships with an endless supply of customers. And so the White Star Line went that extra distance in terms of treating them as human beings. They had a separate dining room. They had a smoking room of their very own. They had a general room, and the general room even had a piano in it. And the passengers could entertain themselves, unheard of in 1912. Most of the crews that worked on the transatlantic ships lived in Southampton. If Dawson's house was still standing, it would provide valuable clues about what sort of man he was and the life he led. A further look at the Titanic signing on book reveals his address as 70 Britain Street. Britain Street is close to the docks and many crews live near here. This address should offer direct evidence of where he lived. But on the trail of Jay Dawson, nothing is ever that simple. Can you help me? I'm looking for a street. I know it's not too far from here. Dr. Richard Howells, who has made a study of the myths surrounding the Titanic, has been on the trail of Jay Dawson for a long time. When Dawson signed on the Titanic, he gave his address as 70 Britain Street, Southampton. All well and good, you might say, except there's a problem. 70 Britain Street, Southampton never existed. I've looked at the census returns, I've looked at the street directories, I've looked at the maps. It wasn't there. It was never there. In Kelly's directory of the streets of Southampton in 1911, it lists Britain Street as having only 28 houses and not 70. However, the American inquiry on the sinking of Titanic lists Dawson as living at 70 Brinton's Road, Southampton. Although the address at Brinton's Road exists, it is never mentioned anywhere else in connection with J. Dawson. One of the real challenges of researching the Titanic is that a lot of the documentation is inconsistent and in a lot of places it's also inaccurate. Clerical errors exist, typographical errors exist. And also I think sometimes people signed on in a hurry. Sometimes people signed on when they're in the pub. And so all sorts of inaccuracies have crept in. However, there are some documents which have a more promising address. When Dawson signed on two other White Star Line ships, the Majestic and the Adriatic, he always gave his address as 17 Britain Street. In Kelly's directory, it confirms the house existed and shows it was registered in the name of a Mrs. Priest. This, at last, is conclusive proof of Dawson's true address. This is the place where he actually lived. Sadly, the house is no longer there. The street has been reduced to only a parking lot and a few office blocks. These pictures are all that are left of the houses in Britain Street. They were destroyed during the Second World War. Southampton would have been full of passengers from many parts of the world, eagerly waiting to board the Titanic. In the movie, Jack Dawson was an American. But what about the real Jack Dawson? The Titanic signing on papers reveal the last but most important piece of information. Here they show he had been born not in England, but in Dublin, Ireland. Could it be that the secret of the real Jack Dawson lies in the city of Dublin? Is it here, amongst these very streets, that his story can be revealed? 
the story of a journey that would take him away from his native island, ending in tragedy aboard the Titanic. Ireland has a special place in the Titanic story. It was from here at Cove, or Queenstown, as it was then called, Titanic made her last port of call before setting off across the Atlantic on her fateful voyage. For hundreds of years, this harbor has been an important military port, but it's also witnessed many tragedies, too. The White Star Line ships regularly sailed from Cove, as millions of people, desperate to escape an appalling famine and lack of work, saw America as a land of opportunity. Senan Maloney has spent the last two and a half years researching into the lives of the Irish aboard the Titanic, whom he believes have been overlooked in all the histories and biographies about this terrible disaster. One person he's been particularly interested in is body 227. Some Titanic researchers have believed Dawson's first name was James, but Senan Maloney is now convinced this is not the case. People tend to have assumed, I think, that he was called James. Perhaps it's the most obvious Christian name that jumps to mind. There is a lot of assumption in Titanic literature, and uh, I think sometimes when somebody rushes into print with a name, it tends to be followed on by those who go thereafter, unthinkingly and unquestioningly. Uh, in fact, the evidence isn't there to support any idea that he was called James. In all the signing on books, Dawson consistently signs his name as J. Dawson. Similarly, in the log taken on the cable ship, the Mackie Bennett, body 227 is only referred to as J. Dawson. When you are signing on literally hundreds of people in a very short space of time, uh, they don't want you there filling out your, your Christian name, your middle name, and, and your surname because it would take forever to get the crew signed on. So for the most part, many of the Titanic's crew simply wrote their first initial and then their surname. However, there can now be revealed new evidence about Jay Dawson. For the first time, it's claimed that Dawson's first name was not James or Jack, as in the movie. His name was Joseph. One person who believes she knows Dawson's true identity is Moira Willigan Fell. She's the direct descendant of a family of Dawson's who can be traced back to the 14th century in Ireland. Margaret Murphy um, was my maternal grandmother and Joseph was her brother. So we grew up with the story of Joseph on the Titanic and it was just part of our family history. It was only when James Cameron's film Titanic came out that they decided to talk in public about Joseph Dawson and his connection with the Titanic. We were very intrigued by the fact that um, Cameron was actually doing a film on the Titanic and literally amazed that the character that DiCaprio was playing was Jack Dawson. It was only after the film came out that we started reading in the press stories about the fact that he was a, a nobody, he was lying unloved and unclaimed in the Nova Scotia grave, and that in fact his life was, was nothing. Um, my mother felt very, very strongly about this and was adamant that people should know who Joe Dawson was. We know that this was the Joseph Dawson who was on board the Titanic because separately and distinctly two um, different branches of the family have uh, preserved this memory and have handed it down uh, to their uh, offspring. And in fact, uh, what adds to their credibility is the fact that every single uh, fact that I have been told by the family checks out in every detail. The census reveals the sort of life Joseph was born into. They lived at 49 Lower Rutland Street a tenement building in a poor part of Dublin where people lived in temporary accommodation. Here it shows the whole family lived in just two rooms. However, they were lucky. There was another family at that address called the Clarks who had nine to a single room and uh, another family that had eight to a single room. And there would have been 
uh, common sanitation facilities uh, and so on, but little in the way uh, of heating or, or, or storage space or anything of that of the modern comforts that we're used to. But how did Joseph Dawson, a poor boy from Dublin, end up in Southampton working as a trimmer on the steamships? We're not sure exactly what date Joseph arrived in England, but what we do have from documentation is that he joined the Royal Army Medical Corps and he was honorably discharged in 1911. So from a life in the army, he went to a life at sea. But Moira and her family can shed even more light on the real Dawson. For the first time, a photograph handed down the family can be revealed. Here at last, we can see what Joseph Dawson actually looked like. Joseph Dawson was based at a military hospital close to Southampton Water. From here, he would have seen the large transatlantic ships as they made their way down this deep water channel to the docks. It's not known why Joseph left the Royal Army Medical Corps, but his temporary discharge paper shows he left the army on the 20th of July, 1911. Four days later, Jay Dawson signed on the White Star Line ship, the Adriatic, as a trimmer for the first time in Southampton. When Dawson signed on these great ships, he would have found the strict Edwardian class hierarchy reflected not only amongst its passengers, but also in its crew. The engine crew lived in their own world. Officers had little to do with the engineers. And the engineers only gave out orders to the leading firemen or stokers. Brian Ticehurst is the newsletter editor for the British Titanic Society and an expert on the Titanic's crew in Southampton. He believes anyone who entered the boiler room did so at their own peril. Some officers got themselves very, very bad reputations and they were despots and they bullied the men around and the more they bullied them, the more they were hated. And if they went down into the stoke hole on a midnight to 4 a.m. shift, they sometimes never ever came back again. Dawson had sailed several times on the Majestic in the fall of 1911. But why did he leave this ship to work on the Titanic? In April 1912, there was doubt as to whether the Titanic would sail on her maiden voyage on time. The problem was coal. Many ships, including Dawson's Majestic, were laid up because of a devastating coal strike. The White Star Line was determined Titanic should set sail. So coal and a number of crew and passengers were transferred from other stranded ships. When Titanic started looking for crew, there was no shortage of people. From the signing on books, we know Dawson had last sailed seven months earlier, in September 1911. He must have been desperate for work. But almost as in the movie, there was to be a cruel twist of fate to the real Dawson. It seems that when he boarded the unsinkable ship Titanic, he left behind a sweetheart. In the movie Titanic, Jack Dawson had a romantic affair with a first-class passenger. Could the real Dawson have had a similar encounter when he was on the ship? A first-class passenger wouldn't have had any interest in social or intellectual to do any more than view the third class from uh, one of the upper decks while they may have been playing in their own area. Uh, the same thing goes with the third class uh, passengers. They were in awe 
of the passengers traveling in upper classes. They, they held them in awe. But new evidence has come to light that the real Dawson had a sweetheart back in Southampton. At the bottom of this photograph, it's possible to make out a bonnet of a young woman. Her name was Nellie Priest. The Priest family were a large family who lived in Southampton at the time of the Titanic. And we know from the 1891 census return that there was mother, father, and six children, one of whom was John, who was about the same age as our Dawson. John Priest was a fireman on the Titanic and survived the tragedy. In the ship's signing on papers, he gives his address as 27 Lower Canal Walk, just around the corner from Dawson. Moira believes this is how Nellie and Joseph met. I believe from my grandmother that um, they met through her brother, John, John Priest, um, who also sailed on the Titanic with Joseph. Nellie was the eldest daughter of the Priest family. Was it likely that Dawson could have met her through John Priest? Yes, indeed. He, that, that is a very, very strong possibility. They were all around the same social level, and they would have gone to the same dance hall and the same pubs, and they would have come home drunk together, and they would have shared everything together. There is strong evidence that Dawson and Nellie Priest knew each other very well. Amazingly, in Kelly's directory, Dawson's address is registered in the name of a Mrs. Priest. Was Dawson's landlady Nellie's mother? In one of Britain's national newspapers, the Daily Mirror, a family called Priest is mentioned only three weeks after the Titanic sank. It records, one woman, Mrs. Priest, had her son restored to her, but each of her two daughters, Nellie and Emmy, lost a sweetheart. Could Nellie's sweetheart possibly be Joseph? The Dawson family thinks so, and believe they can reveal the proof for the first time. At 17 Britain Street, Nellie Priest received a letter written by the White Star Line shortly after the Titanic sank. It told her of the death of Jay Dawson. This letter was given to Joseph's sister, Margaret, by Nellie many years ago. The fact that the letter was addressed to Mrs. J. Dawson has persuaded some to think that they were actually married. Here at last, it seems that the J. Dawson, buried at Fairview Cemetery in Nova Scotia, by this letter is reunited with this true identity, that of Joseph Dawson. More than 80 years, Dawson's simple grave in the eyes of the world has gone unnoticed. Ironically, it's only since the release of the film Titanic and the fictional character of Jack Dawson that his grave has become, in the eyes of some, a symbol of the human tragedy of the Titanic. to find out who the real Dawson was shows the disaster as more than a set of statistics. It was an event that touched real lives. This search has pieced together the life of one of those lost, from the identification of his body, through his work on board the Titanic and other ships, back to his family in Ireland, to reveal the story of the real Jay Dawson. I feel the most important aspect of the Joseph Dawson story is the fact that although he may have boarded the Titanic just as a lowly trimmer and in the eyes of the White Star Line and class ridden society of 1912, he might have only counted for nothing. He actually was a real person that he touched the lives of his family and generations to come and is a person that we'll never forget. The world may not care that Jay Dawson existed on the Titanic, but we have, a, I think, a duty or an obligation to remember every one of those people as being 
unique individuals who contributed each in his own way to the world of 1912.